Uh, so I want to welcome everybody um, to this uh, conference um, of the Duke Law Center for uh, Innovation Policy. Uh, the center focuses on uh, law and policy that will promote innovation and economic growth. The basic question that we're trying to ask is, what, will, um, what changes and developments are likely to arise in upcoming years, and how should policymakers respond to them? This conference um, reflects that focus. So right now, as you all know, in the telecom world, everybody is talking about net neutrality and pending mergers. And the question is, and what, are the, what are other things that we're not talking about that we should be thinking about that are important things that are on the horizon that we should care about beyond these two things that are sucking all of the air out of the room. Well, actually, right now, Ebola is sucking all the air out of the room. And that is the only time Ebola will be mentioned all day today if, 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 I, if I have my way. That's, that's my goal. Um, you just mentioned. I, I said it's the only time with anybody. Um, so the idea is to try to have a serious consideration of what other kinds of issues should be, um, should be uh, important to us and what else is, uh, is looming out there. So as you all know, we have a stellar lineup of speakers. I'm not going to spend um, a lot of time um, uh, uh, talking about them. Just a couple of housekeeping notes so that um, everybody knows. Um, so Vin Cerf is going uh, is gonna to talk. We'll have a Q&A. We'll have, a we'll have um, three panels. The panels are going to try to have, be as interactive as possible. The panels are going to talk for only about 10 minutes each have some responses to each other, and then we're going to have questions. For those panels, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. You can also just email um, the, this email address with any questions, which is actually the most efficient thing, because then we can actually, those of us up there in the dais can be paying attention to what the questions are and, the, and can then tee up those questions. So as the panels go on, please email um, questions to um, Innovation Law. Feel free to tweet as well, although we will not be well, we may be taking questions from the, the Twitter feed. I don't know. Um, anyway, without, um, without any further ado, I trust that Vince Cerf does not need any meaningful introduction. So uh, he has requested none, and therefore I will give him none, other than to say, if you don't know who he is, you're probably at the wrong conference. Uh, <laughs> so without any further ado, Vince. So first of all, uh, oh, I turn this microphone on. How many engineers does it take to turn on a microphone? Are we good? Um, so with Tim Berners-Lee sitting here in the, in the audience, I have to offer an apology right away. You're going to see some charts. And I screwed up horribly about 5 o'clock this morning. And I did not put in all the various web institutions that should be in my list. So I apologize for that. But since you have him on the next panel, you'll be able to get a core dump on that, right? So we'll talk about the WTC and the W3C and the foundation and everything else. Good? OK. So first of all, just to make sure, does everybody understand the difference between packet switching and circuit switching today? Can you show of hands? Yes, everybody knows? Great. So we won't talk about that anymore. Uh, unless you have to, if you have to explain this stuff to your friends, just tell them internet packets behave like postcards. And everything you know about postcards applies to internet packets. And you know, you'll be good. So this all gets started with a four-node network. And then in 77, you know, we tried doing it with three different networks, uh, packet satellite, packet radio, and uh, the ARPANET. And then actually Ethernet sitting over at Xerox Park on the side. And then it turns into this giant thing, which um, Kim Claffey can tell you about, because uh, this is you know, like a half a million networks are all interacting with each other. And it's all distributed, and nobody is told what to do, except please use the same standard protocols so that you'll be interoperable. Um, this thing keeps growing in various dimensions, including new media for linking things together. So mobiles have been the most recent in this whole series of 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, uh, and mobile data. The number of computers on the network has been growing over time. Um, however, it's uh, actually a little unclear how many hosts or computers there are on the net. There are two reasons for this. One of them is that a lot of them are only there episodically, like tablets and pads and mobiles and things like that. Uh, the other one is that some of them are hiding behind firewalls. So as an example, in the case of Google's cloud, and this is probably true also of the Azure cloud at uh, um, Microsoft or uh, Amazon, that there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of computers that you don't actually see, even though they have IP addresses, they're hiding behind uh, firewalls. 
So there are at least a billion machines that are visible on the network that typically have dedicated IP addresses and have uh, domain names. There are an estimated 3 billion, roughly, roughly um, users on the net as of this year. And some of us think that by the end of the decade, perhaps 70% of the uh, world's population will be uh, online in one way or another. There are also a large number of mobiles that are on the net, about 7 billion of them, probably 20% or so are now smartphones which means they also have access to the internet. Just a reminder, there are domain names, which everybody remembers and sees in Tim's URLs. And then there are internet addresses, which we hope you never see. Uh, and they are just 32-bit numbers if you're the IP version 4 uh, IP address. And there are 128-bit numbers if you're the new IP version 6 address. But the domain name system maps from domain names into addresses. And it's important to recognize that that's a core function of the way the internet works. We're also anticipating large numbers of appliances showing up on the network, things like refrigerators and picture frames and mobiles and Google Glass and even light bulbs. Uh, Philips makes a light bulb called a Hue, H-U-E, not H-U-G-H, which can be controlled remotely by your mobile to say how bright is it and what color is it. And uh, you can imagine all kinds of possibilities as more and more devices become part of this network environment. That will, by the way, raise a whole series of legal issues, liability questions, and policy questions as time goes on. Another element of the internet's um, expansion is sensor networks. This is just a picture of the sensor network in my house. It's an IPv6-based radio system. Uh, it's collecting temperature, humidity, and light levels in every room in the house every five minutes. And that's recorded in a server down in the basement. And then at the end of the year, I have good engineering data about how well the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning has worked. One of the rooms is the wine cellar. That's alarmed. If it goes above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, I get an SMS on the mobile telling me I need to go do something about that. We just installed the Nest thermostats that uh, Google bought the company, Nest. And so I ended up with a couple of thermostats. I've installed them. You can remotely control the temperature in the house uh, from your mobile. So uh, again, that raises all kinds of access control questions and things of that kind, potential hazards, uh, information being collected from those devices might allow you to figure out who's at home, how many people are at home, are they awake or asleep? Uh, and some people might consider that to be private information. So we have more policy and legal questions still remaining to be answered. Just as a reminder, IP version 4 was designed in 1973, uh, and it had 4.3 billion terminations. Uh, in 1996, uh, there was a strong need uh, to expand the address space, so we developed a different format. And you might ask, what happened to IP version 5? That was a stream protocol that uh, is intended to support uh, teleconferencing and uh, uh, audio and, and video conferencing, and it didn't scale very well. So we abandoned that and used IPv6 as the next numbering uh, identifier for the IP address space. Um, there's Theoretically, 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses in IPv6. I used to say that's enough addresses so every electron in the universe can have its own web page. Um, I was roundly criticized for this by somebody at Caltech who told me there are 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe, and I was off by 50 orders of magnitude. So I don't say that anymore. We ran out of the v4 address space, at least at the uh, IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority level at ICANN, in February of 2011. The pool is draining from the regional internet registries. Uh, some of them have already run out uh, at APNIC. The uh, Asia Pacific Network Information Center has run out of V4. Uh, LACNIC has run out of V4. The AFRINIC still has some. ARIN, the Americas registry, will run out sometime early, late this year or early next year. So we really do need to move to uh, IP version 6, and we'll have to run in parallel for a while which is technically complicated because you'll get error messages from both flavors of protocol. The domain name system has to deliver both v4 and v6 addresses, and so on. Um, the first IPv6 allocations were formally done in 1999, three years after standardization. At the moment, it's not very heavily penetrant. Uh, we estimate about 3%. Tim, maybe you have better data than that. OK, so that's, that's the best that I have anyway. Uh, but however, it was like 0.03% a year or two ago. So it may very well be that we're starting to see significant uptake. You know, if you follow um, a curve that uh, matches the very scarce data we have now, maybe 50% penetration by 2018. 
a, a reminder about the internet architecture, it's layered. And it turns out the layering has both regulatory and uh, legal implications. So I want you to just keep that in mind, that layering is an important concept. Um, if you're an internet service provider, this is the typical things that ISPs do. They uh, allocate IP addresses to their uh, customers. They offer what's called transit service, which means if you hand them a packet, they promise to deliver it somewhere on the internet all around the world. Uh, they, I'll, I'll t say a little bit more about how the ISPs interconnect with each other. We call that peering. Uh, they are typically responsible for doing domain name resolution, at least the initial uh, uh, resolution for users who are trying to go somewhere on Tim's World Wide Web. And then, of course, some of the ISPs offer applications like email, web services, postings, and so on. Um, peering is uh, simply the interconnection of the networks. And that big colorful picture that I showed you before uh, tells you that there must be a lot of peering going on because there's a half a million networks that are all interconnected one way or another. The important thing is that most of the peering agreements, the interconnection agreements among the networks of the internet are done on a handshake, not even a written contract. And most of them don't involve the exchange of money. The reason for this, in part, is that historically that's how it got started. But also, there was a kind of a mutual benefit of interconnection. You know, I carry, uh, you carry my traffic to further away than my network goes, and vice versa. And so, for a long time, as long as the two parties were roughly the same size, carried traffic over the same geographic distance, had uh, approximately equal traffic flows in both directions, it was easier to just handshake and say, let's interconnect, not worry about accounting for how much traffic each of the parties was carrying for the other. Uh, that sort of shifted over time. We have disparities in the size of the networks. Uh, some networks insist on being paid for, um, for peering. Other, uh, other networks uh, work out other kinds of arrangements. Typically, um, if the amount of traffic that's, that's being exchanged between any particular pair of networks is modest, they may actually meet at an internet exchange point. We call this sort of public peering. Uh, when the uh, traffic levels get high enough, sometimes the network service providers will decide to uh, directly interconnect with each other by building facilities or leasing facilities at much higher speeds in order to accommodate the traffic flows. Um, the one thing that's peculiar about peering uh, has to do with the economics of it. Uh, if, if you are peering with another uh, network, you will carry traffic to your destinations only from the endpoints of the other peer. But if the other peer is peering with other networks, you don't carry traffic going from those other networks through you. And the reason for this is that you're not getting paid for it. So uh, you get paid by the edges of the network that, that are your customers. And when you peer with somebody else, if you don't exchange any money, then you're only getting paid by the people who are initiating traffic uh, connections to you. And that's perfectly OK. It worked just fine. You just don't want to be the guy in the middle who got no, no revenue at all for carrying traffic from a peer uh, one or, or two hops away. Um, just a reminder about domain names. We started with eight uh, at the beginning of the development of the domain name system. Usually people say seven, but we had Dart ARPA there for uh, transition purposes. And then in 2000, we added a few more. And in 2004, we added yet a few more. Actually, Triple X didn't make it in 2004. It got in in 2011 after a whole lot of debate over whether we should have such a top level domain. This, by the way, is a good example of why there's such controversy over domain names, because they're words or they're identifiers. And sometimes they mean things, and that's intentional. The trouble is some people don't like what they mean. As a result, you know, there's dispute over whether such a thing should be a top-level domain. Triple X was an example of that. And in 2012, ICANN uh, opened up the floodgates and said, uh, anybody who wants to have a top-level domain can apply. Uh, please send a check for $185,000. They got 1,930 applications per top-level domain. If you do the math, it's on the order of $300 million plus. 751 of the 1930 applications were in conflict, and so now there's a process of resolution. Either there's agreements going on among the parties who are competing for a particular top-level domain, or alternatively, there's an auction. 
And recently, several auctions have been conducted. The amounts of money collected are on the order of 10 to $14 million. And the question is what to do with that money. And now there's a long debate in the ICANN space about uh, practices for, for using that particular uh, uh, revenue stream. And finally, there's internationalized domain names. For many, many years, domain names were just uh, using Latin characters. And then the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, developed a, a way of including non-Latin uh, characters in the domain name space, Cyrillic, uh, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, Korean, and so on, using the Unicode uh, encoding system. This was revised again in 2008, and now it's possible to register domain names um, at all levels using non-Latin characters. That too, by the way, uh, opens up uh, potential hazards because um, it turns out that, that some character sets have characters that look like other uh, alphabetical characters. If you think about Greek and Cyrillic and Latin in particular, uh, you can spell words in Cyrillic that look like words in Latin, but they don't mean the same thing. And if you were to click on that as a domain name, you might go to a place you weren't intending to go to because of the confusion. And so there's been a lot of debate and tension over how to deal with that problem. Um, I'm not going to go through point by point here, and this is where I apologize to Tim. I should have included the World Wide Web institutions as well and failed to do so for reasons that I can only think were a consequence of doing this at 5 o'clock in the morning. But I want to um, emphasize to you how many institutions there are that are associated with uh, Internet's uh, administration, uh, and also to emphasize the fact that they get created at need. So they weren't all created as, as, as the Internet uh, development is starting. They get created because there is apparently a need for an institution to uh, help manage some aspect or administer some aspect of the Internet. And so you have to learn, if you're serious about law and the Internet, you better learn the alphabet suit. You better understand what those institutions are, how they are operated, what their responsibilities are, how they interact and relate to each other. Because if you don't understand that, you won't understand how to help a client uh, or how to help shape policy that involves either the cooperation or resistance of some of those institutions to whatever policy it is that you're considering. So you can see that this has been going on since 1973. Um, it keeps going. Uh, and what you start to see as the uh, 2000s happen uh, is uh, continued regional expansion of Internet uh, administration. Uh, uh, Tim's work with the World Wide Web Consortium is another good example of that. We've opened up three different uh, locations that support uh, World Wide Web development. Am I correct? One in uh, Cambridge, one in London, and one in... Uh, a fourth one in China now. Wow, okay. So there's a, a, this is a trend, I think, that happens. Internet penetrates, it gets uh, an increasing amount of use, and then suddenly people discover they want to participate in various aspects of Internet's evolution, and institutions get created to, to support that. So uh, now to emphasize what's happening and why this is an, a, a big issue for you as you look towards 2020, all the things that used to be separate are suddenly converging uh, on the use of the Internet protocol as a way of transporting these media. So telephony is moving to voice over IP. Television is a business, but video is the medium, and that medium is moving, has moved to uh, Internet. The most visible example of that in the U.S. was Netflix, uh, which has been offering streaming video for uh, several years now. Uh, YouTube is another example of streaming video. It's my prediction, however, that as we move to much higher speeds on the Internet, we'll move from streaming to download and playback. And the reason for this is trivial. If you're running at a gigabit a second, which is what the Google Fiber Networks do, it only takes 15 to 20 seconds to download an hour's worth of video. And so you, you actually load it faster than you can watch it. And by the way, that makes it a file transfer. And by the way, that makes it easier on the network. Because instead of having to deliver the packets exactly at the right time to avoid video and audio breakup, if you lose a packet, it doesn't matter. It was just a file transfer and you retransmit it. You're not watching while all this is happening. 
So download and playback makes a lot of good sense to me as you get to much higher speed. So the, this streaming video thing is an anomaly and a function of the low data rates that we have in the US. At least that's my theory. Some people say, well, where would, how could you download it and store it? Well, anybody who has a DVR already knows the answer to that. I remember buying three terabytes of disk drive for about $150 just recently. And as I was buying this little thing, I remember thinking, I remember paying $1,000 for a 10 megabyte disk drive in 1979. It was the size of a shoebox. And then I thought, what would have happened if I tried to buy a terabyte of memory in 1979? And when you do the math, it would have been $100 million. And I didn't have $100 million then. And to be honest, I don't have $100 million now either. But, but if I'd had $100 million in 1979, I'm pretty sure my wife wouldn't let me spend it on disk drives, right? So, so it's incredible how rapidly the cost of storage has dropped. The other thing which is happening, of course, is that every possible medium known to mankind is now being used to carry internet protocol packets. And here's a, you know, a list. Of, it's even crazy things like balloons at, at Google. You know, we've got these balloons uh, at 60,000 feet that are doing Wi-Fi uh, to the ground, and then we're, uh, we're doing store and forward between the balloons in order to reach a place where you can get to the ground and, and join the rest of the internet. So all of this stuff is basically saying that all the various media that used to be separate, the telephone network, the cable networks, and the uh, broadcast networks are now simply converging on underlying internet stuff. The, uh, the, uh, we have some friends here from the FCC, so they could choose to disagree when we get to Q&A. Um, but here's the way I look at it. The Telecom Act starts in 34, a really important piece of legislation, uh, universal service concept. Uh, arrangements to help fund uh, the creation of small carriers and uh, deals made to allow for AT&T to be a monopoly, uh, but a regulated monopoly. And then in 1996, a revision of the Telecom Act. There are, and remember, I'm just an engineer, so if I got this a little off, uh, feel free to correct me. Um, but Title II, if I'm remembering correctly, is about telephony, Title VI is about cable, and Title I is about information services. <clears throat> and there was a period of time when uh, the telephone companies and the cable companies were both offering broadband internet service. I mean, this was a new thing starting in sort of the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and it had um, an interesting side effect from the regulatory point of view because the telephone companies offering internet service were regulated under Title II. The cable companies offering cable modem internet service were regulated under Title VI, and these were not the same regulations. And the two um, groups of institutions said, uh, we're both offering the same service. Why are you forcing us to be regulated differently? And the FCC chose, there were several paths that it could have taken, perhaps. But it chose to say, well, to make it all fair, we'll, go, we'll call the internet an information service, and there won't be any communication element of it at all. Um, this is. Technically, not a good idea, because whether you like it or not, the internet is, in fact, uh, a communication system and it has layers. And one of the important layers is the bearing of packets by various media. And so another alternative would have been to create a title we'll call internet title, except for the fact that uh, it might be very hard to get new legislation passed, uh, especially in the Congress of today. So. That option wasn't taken, and instead the option was to uh, declare internet an information service. But this has led to a lot of complicated difficulty, and I, this, the story is not over yet. Uh, here's another example of a serious conflict caused by technology. Trademarks, as uh, all of you should know and probably do know, are not unique. You're allowed to have the same trademark in different classifications. So I can have the ABC Butter Company and the ABC Car Company and the ABC ski company, um, but uh, only one abc.com. Now, I could have an abc.com and an abc.net and an abc.us and an abc.fr and so on. Um, each of those is unique. The question is, which ABC company gets which top level, registered in which top level domain? And the answer is, nobody knows. And there's a lot of argument now about whether it's OK to have so many top level domains that now you have to register in all of them, which makes the, the domain name registrars happy because you pay for that. It makes the trademark lawyers unhappy because they have to keep checking every top level domain to see whether their protected trademark has been registered in a domain that, that they think should have been theirs. And then there's a big fight 
So uh, we just have a, a mismatch between the domain name design, which didn't take trademark into account because we didn't even think of it at the time, 1984. I mean, we're just a bunch of engineers, you know, what do we know? Uh, and when the, now this is actually Tim's fault. So um, and I think I've, I've probably said this before, so it won't be a surprise, but the um, visibility of the domain name in the URL um, led uh, companies to recognize that the domain name was a very important uh, identifier that was representing their corporate interest, and therefore they were much more concerned about how that looked and who had access to it and who got to register it. If we found some way to suppress the visibility of the domain names, we wouldn't have this problem. But Tim, that's not your fault because there wasn't any other. Especially, you know, the first browser yes. didn't, didn't have a URL bar. Oh, it didn't? The first browser didn't have a URL bar. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh, my. For security. So you put it in so people knew where they were going, essentially. Yeah, that's not fascinating. So, so, now, so what would have happened if, if we were to project this is that if you had proceeded in the direction you were going in, we wouldn't have had quite the trademark domain issue, but we would have had the question of where, how do I avoid going to a place I didn't want to go because I couldn't tell where I was going. Several bad words occur to me right now. Okay. Uh, speaking of safety and security, uh, if you're talking about regulation, if you're talking about legal matters, you have to uh, accept that the internet is not always a safe place. It has vulnerabilities. The software has bugs. They get exploited. People distribute malware. Uh, they send messages around that try to induce you to click on something that will cause your uh, computer to become infected. Uh, there are distributed denial of service attacks. Uh, and by this note, this is note botnet origins. The reason that we have DDoS attacks is because people are able to um, invade other people's computers, take control over them without any visibility, and then uh, use those machines to launch packets at a target. And we call that collection of machines that have been infected and it's under control of a botnet general, uh, a botnet. And so if we had more secure software, if we had better designed operating systems and browsers, we would have less infected machines. But we're not very good about writing bug-free software, and so we have this problem. Uh, we also have the problem of identity theft because there's so much information out on the net about each of us that some people have enough data to go register credit cards and other kinds of things uh, to pretend to be us and therefore uh, uh, get us into trouble. There are all kinds of privacy and integrity issues arising. And I want to uh, remind you of something that the uh, president of Estonia uh, expresses uh, a major concern about having to do with integrity. He's less worried about confidentiality than he is about integrity. And the example he gives is very compelling. He says, I don't mind if everybody knows what my blood type is, but I mind a lot if my medical, re medical records have been altered to show the wrong blood type, because if I go into the hospital and I'm given the wrong kind of blood, I might die. So he's worried about integrity because of that, uh, even more than he is about confidentiality. I'm, I'm sure that he's also very concerned about confidentiality for obvious reasons. OK, so now we get to the heart of the matter. Uh, and, and we're not going to try to talk about every single one of these bullets. I want you to understand and appreciate the scope of the issues that you face as you try to look at regulatory policy, governance, and law with regard to the internet. This thing has become so penetrant. It has become so much a part of uh, our infrastructure that Every possible bad thing that could happen in the real world also happens in this cyberspace virtual world. And the consequence of that is that we have to figure out how to cope with disputes, with uh, what we either do or don't label as criminal actions, uh, and all kinds of other things. For example, rules of evidence are in the middle of the bullet on the left there. This business of collecting digital information which you intend to use for prosecutorial purposes raises the question of how accurate is the data and how have you managed to assure that it has integrity, that it hasn't been altered or modified. And we all know how easy it is to modify digital content. So how do we build a chain of custody in the digital world 
that has uh, equal or better um, uh, protection as we have had to do in the physical world. Uh, another example is jurisdiction and global networking. The internet has this peculiar feature that it actually doesn't realize that there are countries and national boundaries. The internet address space is insensitive to uh, any national boundary, and that was by uh, a purpose, uh, purposeful design. Uh, the simple reason for this is you'll see uh, from a small illustration. Imagine, for the sake of argument, that we had, remember this was designed for the Defense Department. Imagine that, um, that you're country A, and, uh, and you're planning to attack country B in a couple of weeks. Imagine that you have an, uh, an internet address space which is based on national identifiers. Can you imagine being country A, planning to attack country B, having to go to country B and saying, well, listen, we're planning to attack you in a couple of weeks and we need some address space to run our command and control system while it's operating in your country while we're attacking you. And so could we please have some address space? Well, I didn't think that was gonna fly. And so the architecture of the internet said, there is nothing about the internet address space other than topology that uh, distinguishes one net from another. Uh, the side effect of this, of course, is that the traffic flows without realizing it's crossing any international boundaries. But uh, you all appreciate that laws are different from country to country. And things that might be crimes in one country are not necessarily crimes in another. To make matters worse, the perpetrator may be in one jurisdiction and the victim in another. And that's not only an international question, it could be even domestically, you might have different jurisdictions that treat various and sundry crimes differently. And the problem here is that um, figuring out how to deal with interjurisdictional um, legal problems uh, has to be uh, accommodated. Uh, on the international scale, uh, a number of countries are party to something called MLAT, which is a multilateral uh, legal assistance treaty, and the uh, provisions of that one say that if you uh, encounter a victim in one country and a uh, perpetrator in another country, the party that is prosecuting the perpetrator may actually be able to use the MLAT to, or the other way around, if the, the victim wants to um, prosecute uh, the uh, perpetrator in another country, the MLAT provision allows the victim to activate some legal exchange between countries that have agreed on the treaty. So we have a lot of work to do to figure out how to deal with global uh, interjurisdictional issues. There are all kinds of other uh, big problems like misinformation and what liability there might be uh, in consequence of posting uh, deliberate misinformation. What about accidental, you know, somebody just didn't know and put up something that somebody else believed and took an action on and caused trouble. There's all kinds of arguments about taxation whether or not transactions should be taxed, and if so, where, who should get the revenue for it, and what rate. And then there's governance over on the right-hand side, uh, and I won't even try to walk through all of those bullets. I, what I want you to appreciate is that governance is not just a matter of domain names and IP addresses. Governance covers just an enormous amount of territory here, most of which is outside the range of ICANN's responsibility. And uh, I want to come back to that observation when we look at some of the governance debates that have been going on in the last uh, few years. But please look at this list and think about all the various legal and uh, organizational structures that may have to be in place in order to cope with this scope. Let me give facilitation of e-commerce as an example. Today, when you're carrying out a transaction, certainly one of any significance, it's very important for you to know who is the other party. And it may be even more important for you to know, how do I get to that other party in the event that our contractual relationship is breached? So identification of the parties turns out to be very important. Well, in an online environment, this is not so trivial. Uh, and so people will be looking for ways of digitally identifying the other party so that, so that they can strongly authenticate both sides are interested in this. So how can we do that? Well, one possibility is to use digital signatures and certificate systems in order to validate who the parties are. Uh, anyone who's been paying attention to this space knows that certificate authorities have become compromised, and so they can issue certificates that are, in fact, false. 
This gets particularly bad when it turns out the certificate is being used to validate a piece of software that you think you're downloading as an update from Apple or Google or somebody else, and it turns out to be a bad guy's software that you just downloaded, turning your machine into a member of the botnet. So we have some serious implementation problems of strong authentication that need to be dealt with, to say nothing of the question of uh, legal disputes that arise because of the failure of some of these uh, kinds of uh, authenticators. Um, there's also a question of accessibility uh, in the, in the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act sense. Uh, and here we've done poorly, uh, all of us, I think, in general, uh, providing services on the net uh, to figure out how to provide them in such a way that everyone will have access to those facilities in, in a convenient way. Uh, and it's a non-trivial problem. I mean, if you design a beautiful web page that has a two-dimensional uh, display uh, that uh, anyone who can see will easily understand, if you have to experience that website serially and in, in audio, it may not be nearly as understandable as you would like it to be. Despite that, I have to tell you, I had one extraordinary experience with um, a blind colleague at Google uh, we were in the middle of a, of a video conferencing hangout, and uh, we both realized that we needed to go Google something in order to uh, look up and, and establish a fact. And so he beat me to it, and I was hearing his JAWS, that's the uh, audio uh, web page uh, rendering system. I was hearing him doing his interaction with the web page. It was talking three times faster than I'm talking now, uh, and uh, and he would. He knew what was some of the things were going to be, sort of like an airline pilot who's expecting certain things when you're flying. So he knew what the sequence of, of uh, audio announcements would be, so he would cut them off after you know, the first word or even the first syllable. And of course, I'm listening to this, not seeing the screen. I'm just hearing all this going on. And how the hell can any normal human being do that? And so he beat me to the answer. And then we spent the next 10 minutes uh, talking about how the hell did you do that? Uh, so some people are able to use the net despite its, uh, uh, I would say, inadequate uh, accessibility, but that's not a good answer. A good answer is designing things to be accessible for people who can't hear or can't see or can't move easily or have multiple uh, problems. Safety is another term which I would like very much to put into your vocabulary. We talk too much about cyber security. And the reason I think this is not a good thing for us is that as soon as you hear the term cybersecurity, you also think of national security. And now you start thinking about national responses to attacks against networks or attacks against targets. And the awkward thing about this is that it immediately leads you into a space where you're starting to think about, OK, I've just detected a cyber attack. I think that this is a national scale attack. What means do I have to respond? And what if you decide to respond using conventional military tools? I mean, what if it's a nuclear response? And the bad thing about this is that it's not always easy to figure out who attacked you. There are such things as false flag attacks. It's possible for country A to pretend to be country B attacking country C. And so country C thinks country B attacked him, and country C decides to respond to country B, and meanwhile country A is smiling because it was pretending to be country B, and so now B and C are at war with each other, and A is sitting back enjoying the, uh, the show. This is not an acceptable outcome, and it's also not acceptable to uh, launch sort of automatic responses to things. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that um, uh, you believe that some important part of the infrastructure is under attack. Uh, let's say it's the power grid in some part in the northeastern part of the country. Uh, and uh, it is a denial of service attack that's interfering with the way in which the critical uh, infrastructure is operating. And you decide that you're going to launch a counter cyber attack. And your intent is to wipe out the disk drives of all the attacking computers. Except it turns out that all those million attacking computers belong to ordinary Americans who had no idea that their machines were infected. And by wiping out their disk drives, you just had a very deleterious effect on our entire economy because some of those things on those disk drives were important to running somebody's business or carrying out uh, your daily activity. So blindly responding to cyber attacks is a really bad idea. The trouble is figuring out who done it is not so easy. So attribution is important and hard. And therefore, we should be really careful about uh, instituting policies that involve 
automatic response to various kinds of cyber attacks. And I'll come back to multi-stakeholder policy development in just a second. Here's an example of the kinds of policy issues that uh, we wrestle with here in Washington and some of you perhaps wrestle with elsewhere, uh, some of which we've already touched upon. Uh, I know that we're not supposed to go deep into network neutrality, but let me just mention to you um, why that's been such a big mess. Um, when the internet was operating during the um, mid or early 1990s, uh, just as Tim's World Wide Web is exploding all over the landscape, most of us were getting access to the internet by dial-up. And there were probably 8,000 internet service providers in operation at the time. The way in which you changed service providers was to dial a different number using your, you know, modem that sounded like a cat whose tail was being pulled. Um, but then along comes broadband. And the provision of that over cable and over digital subscriber loops on copper or eventually fiber uh, required uh, the distribution of physical equipment at people's homes that they couldn't buy themselves necessarily. So, uh, and the, the number of suppliers was very limited, the cable codes and the telcos primarily. So suddenly, in, from a choice of 8,000 service providers, you had a choice of one or two, or if you're in the rural part of the country, maybe zero, because there wasn't any broadband access out there. Well, that reduced the amount of competition fairly dramatically. And so the, the uh, issue arises, well, what if somebody is offering broadband service and also offering a variety of other applications on top, including uh, high-speed internet, and someone else, some other uh, uh, application provider, is now competing with you using the broadband service, the internet service you're supplying to one of your customers. Well, there's an obvious temptation to interfere with the uh, alternative party service, if it's video, for example. Well, why don't we mess up Netflix so that they'll have to use my video service on my broadband uh, system instead? And I'm just, I'm not saying anybody did that. It's just an example of a concern that arises. And the consequence of this is to seek ways of preventing parties who are providing broadband service from abusing that provision of service if there is inadequate competition to discipline the market, inadequate choice for the user to choose another supplier if they don't like the service that they're getting. And therein lies part of the debate that's still going on here in the US and elsewhere around the world. Um, think a little bit about um, other problems. With, we see content on the network that some people don't like. And so they think, well, that should be removed. We had a recent experience of this in Europe, where the European uh, Court um, of Justice declared that there was a right to be forgotten. And uh, I have to admit that uh, my first reactions to this were puzzlement, uh, in a way, because uh, it seemed to me uh, two things were not so clear to me. One of them is that the, the way this was proposed to be implemented is that the index that companies like Google and uh, Microsoft and others create was supposed to be expunged of things pointing to a place that somebody didn't like because they thought it uh, uh, embarrassed them or it was old information that shouldn't be available anymore. Well, erasing stuff from the index doesn't actually erase the content from the net. Um, and it also uh, turns into a very difficult problem for the index search provider. Let me explain. Basically, we have to remember everything we're supposed to forget, because we have to remember it in order to erase it from the index. And you know, if you extrapolate this ad absurdum, pretty soon you remember more stuff than there is on the internet that you have to forget, because it accumulates over time. And you never know when it's going to come back again if it went away. And so you now have to keep remembering all the stuff you're supposed to erase. So this is not making a whole lot of sense to me, even though you can sort of understand why someone might not want something on the net that shows them doing something stupid when they were 16 years old or 18 or at a college party or something else. But the question of how to implement that is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, quite open. Um, the last point here, uh, and I want to get to some Q&A, is this multi-stakeholder internet governance. And I think I have some uh, a timeline here for you. Uh, to, uh, to consider. In 2003, the ITU sponsored a World Summit on the Information Society. And the first question that the diplomats, remember this is a, 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 a 
intergovernmental meeting. The diplomats' first question was, what's an information society? And one of the answers was, well, the internet is kind of like that. So their first question was, who's in charge of the internet? No one, and we said, well, no one. It's a fully distributed environment. No one believed us. So they looked around and they discovered ICANN. So they decided ICANN must be in charge of the internet. Then they noticed there was a contract between the Department of Commerce, NTIA, and ICANN. Therefore, NTIA must be in charge of the internet. There ensued a debate on this subject, and there was created a working group on internet governance to figure out, well, what is internet governance, and who should do it, and uh, you know, who has the authority to do what? Uh, that didn't get resolved either, and so out of this debate came the Internet Governance Forums, which started in 2006 and have happened every year since. And now they, they have spawned regional Internet Governance Forums as well. Uh, the ITU still plays uh, a fairly visible role in all this. Uh, in 2012, there was a World Conference on International Telecommunications. There is an International Telecommunications Treaty which involves the behavior of uh, telcos uh, across national boundaries. And in that uh, particular meeting, that, by the way, the previous one had been held in 1988. So the most recent one was 2012 and nothing in between. In 1988, the internet was not very visible to anyone except us geeks. So they didn't have any provision in there for anything like the internet. In 2012, there was all kinds of debate having to do with content, suppression of, uh, of information, uh, surveillance. I mean, you, you name it, they brought it up. Uh, charging structures, uh, settlement rates, all kinds of things. 89 countries signed the treaty and 55 of them didn't. This is the first time in the history of that uh, treaty that there has been such a schism. And uh, the reverberations continue. Uh, there was a World Telecom Standards Assembly also in that year, and then the ICANN uh, had a bunch of task forces trying to look at different aspects of governance. And this year uh, in Brazil, a big meeting called Net Mundial happened where the question of multi-stakeholder internet governance was discussed, and a very interesting uh, document came out saying that the internet ought to be managed and governed uh, in such a way that the policies for internet governance were made by all of the interested parties affected by the governance policy. And so this is a multi-stakeholder thing. Governments were part of the story, but not all of it. The private sector, uh, the uh, technical community, and civil society should all have seats at the table uh, when governance matters and policy are debated and adopted. And so Net Mundial uh, cemented uh, in a very significant statement those notions. There is a plenipotentiary meeting coming up in Busan, Korea, which uh, the, determines what the ITU will do over the next four years in terms of standards, in terms of development, in terms of radio uh, planning. And then in 2015, there's a World Economic Forum coming up, which will also discuss internet governance. So I'm going to stop there uh, and hope that this uh, <laughs> just uh, core dump uh, to use an old term, uh, isn't, is, has not caused a lot of confusion. What I would like to do, though, is spend the rest of my time, which is about 12 minutes, um, talking to you or hearing from you about issues that you think should be on the agenda for uh, internet governance and regulation and uh, legal policy. So I'll stop there. I'll thank you for your time, and let's have a discussion. So uh, do we have microphones around, or people are just going to shout at each other, which is OK. OK. Just toss it. <laughs> Who has it first? Aha. Uh -huh. Our CTO. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question. Uh, you mentioned a long laundry list of things that I, I mean, I don't think even the FCC, if it was in uh, megalomonical mode, would want to take on all of those nationally. What would you see where the intersection is between internet-specific activities that mm -hmm. are just dealing with that and where the banking regulators or banking policy, the criminal justice system, right. and everybody else would need to deal with that? Because otherwise, I don't see that this is, it's like trying to do the old cyber e-everything yes. model. Right, and so actually, I think you and I are, are in agreement. Who's going to be next, by the way? But we don't know. All right, that's fine. I'm, I'm, so 
first of all, I think you touch on a very important point, which is that um, things that are troublesome, let me use a very generic term, not illegal necessarily, but just troublesome, uh, occur both on the internet and not on the internet. So fraud, for example, happens in every, all kinds of media. Uh, you can commit fraud on the phone, you can commit fraud with the Postal Service, you can commit fraud face to face, uh, and you can commit fraud on the internet. In all cases, it's fraud. So the question is, is there anything special about uh, that uh, act taking place on the net? And the answer may be no. So it may very well be that some things that we declare to be criminal or illegal or unacceptable that occur on the internet are no more and no less bad than they are in other media or uh, by other means. Uh, what this suggests to me is that the legal system should not be totally fixated on whether something happened on the internet proper. It's, so in the case of fraud or the banking regulations and everything else, what one might be looking for is to make sure that the things that make the banking, uh, a banking transaction, let me call it safe, in a non-internet environment is equally safe in an internet environment. Now, in that case, we have to ask ourselves, how do I do remote digital uh, authorization or authentication uh, in, the, in the internet space, as opposed to a face-to-face -face transaction where I'm getting a, a physical signature on a piece of paper? So I, I think that, that we should not get overly fixated on the internet's presence, except where it turns out to um, create circumstances which are different and require possibly different tools uh, to respond to. And internet does have the property that, that its transactions can occur across national boundaries or other jurisdictional boundaries in ways that other kinds of face-to-face -face transactions don't. And I think we have to cope with that somehow. So I don't know whether that gets to, to where you wanted to go. Yeah, I mean, what issues would you see as being so core internet, that internet governance that is you know, specific to the internet would be involved. Is it just names and numbers? Is it my, you know, the kind of a national regulatory okay. type of activities of competition regulation that is sector specific? That's what I'm okay. curious about. So actually, I want to resist in, uh, using the phrase internet governance to be exclusively technical. What I want to say is that it, it touches, I think anyway, that it touches all of the things that you mentioned because of the internet's presence in all of those transaction spaces, or as David Clark uses the term, tussle spaces, which I think is a very uh, colorful term. So the, and the reason that I would prefer not to be so narrow about inter, what the term internet governance is if you, if you fail to recognize that that the things that go on in the internet, especially up at the application layer and the content layer and everything else, have the same kind of impact as these uh, same content thing shows up in book publishing, it shows up in newspapers, it shows up in radio broadcasting or, or films and so on. Um, you have to be able to cope with these problems in all the spaces that they appear in, including internet. I don't think separating internet out helps us in that case. Uh, so I, I, think, I think you and I would still end up in the same place, which is that we have to cope with all of the problems. And in some cases, we have to say it doesn't matter whether the problem occurred in the internet or elsewhere. We still have to cope with it. OK, let's see if there's anything else. Let's go on. The, this is part of my health plan. No, 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 I like this part. Oh, right. There we go. This is uh, to do with the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, the internet doesn't recognize national boundaries. But then we have got the point of data residing across national boundaries. So yesterday, I listened to a webcast where the FBI director was actually talking about the fact that encryption is bad for law enforcement because it allows them not to be able to access certain information. And his contention was that, that as manufacturers of devices, Google should possibly provide back door or some mechanism well, for he said front door instead of back yeah door, he said front door yeah he said a front door but should provide a mechanism for let's say uh, law enforcement for fbi to be able to tap a phone or a person who's in india or china or anywhere else and that actually i think brings us to one of these bigger issue of where does the data reside and how should we ensure that the jurisdictional uh, aspects of the uh, where the data resides or whose data it is and how do we get into that sort of a thing. I mean, whether it is who's, whether it is the citizen thing or whether it's the server. Where it so uh, there, this is a very good question because it raises all of the uh, serious problems that 
do we have with an internet which is penetrant everywhere, uh, a national decision to do something can have an impact on people not in, that, in the sphere of uh, authority of that national government. This is sometimes called extraterritoriality. And so the proposal by uh, the director of the FBI to have a front door to get into decrypt traffic uh, that has been encrypted on an end-to-end -end basis potentially has an effect on somebody who's using such a device or using such a service who's not within the jurisdiction of the FBI. So the question then is, well, what should we do about that? And uh, to be quite honest with you, I only, the only way I can see any of this working, setting aside front door, back door, or anything else, is that there have to be some international agreements about these things. The extraterritoriality without an international agreement feels wrong to me. Now, remember, I'm just an engineer. But uh, my sense is that we are going to have to figure out collectively what things that we want to, what behaviors we're going to accept and what behaviors we're not going to accept. And there have to be multilateral or bilateral agreements about what to do about that. But to take uh, unilateral action is tricky. Let's uh, talk about some of the other countries that were uh, deeply concerned about the uh, Snowden revelations. Uh, they wanted to build so sort of fortress around Europe, for example, or fortress around Brazil. And this is, I think, uh, not, it, it's, it's actually a, uh, it's not a very helpful thing to try to do for several reasons. The first one is that if you're belief is that internet commerce is beneficial to each country, that reaching markets outside of the country is important, then building a fortress around your country in order to prevent exchange uh, is going to reduce significantly the benefit of the internet to your own GDP and the interests of your citizens. So building a fortress around each country doesn't sound like the right thing to do. On the other hand, there is this extraterritoriality problem, and the solution to that, as far as I know, maybe you will be able to say different in your panels, is to have multilateral agreements about these things. So that's where I think we're going to be forced to end up. It's not very different from the uh, problem of convergence, where all media, which used to be distinct and separate on physically distinct networks and managed and, and regulated distinctly, are no longer regulatable distinctly because they're no longer on separate facilities. They are now part of this global internet environment with more and more devices showing up as part of that uh, system. So we have to treat them collectively and not individually. OK, other questions? This is great for the cameras. I mean, great. If I can race fa fast enough, the camera won't be able to keep up, and I'll just be this disembodied voice. Yes? Hi, Vin. Thanks so much for your fabulous talk. Um, the good news is my talk's going to be a lot shorter. <laughs> um, the uh, question, you, you raised uh, speed as an issue that would enable um, downloading as opposed to streaming. You mean data rate as opposed to the drug? Yes. OK, okay fine. I'm good. I'm all right. I'm bandwidth. with you. Sorry, bandwidth. Not oh, no, yeah. actually, it was funny. Uh, yes, uh, I was going to ask you how much you think copyright concerns play into the download versus stream uh, issue. Because uh, right, I know for myself, there are times I would really much rather have downloaded because of network problems, but uh, it won't let me. So you know, this is one of those awful uh, problems. The economics of digital are so different <laughs> from the economics of physical media that uh, this, this is forcing an industry which built a perfectly good business model based on replicating things in physical form to have to scratch its head and think, how am I going to redo my business model? This is not the first time this sort of thing has happened. New technologies come along. They change the economics of the way things work. And your old business model just might not work anymore. I mean, my, my favorite cartoon of this is the buggy whip guy who, around 1905, is getting really worried about this thing called the automobile and goes to Ford and says, look, I don't want to go out of business. My buggy whips are my, my only business. So I want you to design the automobile so that it has a sensor on it so that when you want it to go faster, you whip it with the buggy whip. And you know, Ford says, you know, we think we'd rather have a little pedal down on the bottom of the floor that you can use your, your foot. And the other guy says, yeah, but that'll put me out of business. And Ford says, I don't mean to pick on Ford, by the way. I'm just, they're just the emblematic of the automobile industry. Uh, Ford says, well, you know, we're not going to do it that way because it doesn't make any sense. And so the buggy whip guy goes out of business or does a specialty thing. So the side effect of uh, the change in technology really has to be taken into account. On the copyright side, 
I think that we might actually end up having to think of different ways of monetizing that which we produce. Um, I don't think that the notion of copyright will go away. I don't think that the notion of being paid for an item will go away. But I remember something that John Perry Barlow said to me. Uh, he's, as you, some of you may remember, was the lyrics writer for The Grateful Dead. And he said to me one day, I don't really want to be paid for the song I wrote. I want to be paid for the song I'm going to write. I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, this is a, the notion of subscription is rather interesting. What, it, what do you do? When you, when you subscribe to something, the implication is you're expecting to get something of value in the future, which you haven't seen yet. That's why you subscribe to a magazine or a newspaper or maybe Netflix or something like that. So I'm not arguing that subscription is the only business model that makes any sense in this digital world. But I am suggesting that we need to rethink what business models might make sense as we move into this environment, because it is awfully easy to reproduce digital stuff. And it's awfully easy to distribute it very quickly. So I, again, I'm just an engineer, and I'm not a businessman, and I don't necessarily, if I, I'm, I'm not sure that a business model, if it jumped up and hit me in the face, would be recognizable. But other people are smart enough to figure out different business models. And they're going to have to, because Darwin was right. You only have two choices, adapt or die. That's all the choice Darwin gives us. And we have to do that in the corporate sense as well. OK, we are exactly at 9.40, which is when I was supposed to shut up. So I leave it to, yeah. uh, to you to decide whether I should. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm going to go first. I'm going to start off Oh, okay. Good. 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 Okay, fair enough. And that gives you plenty of room. to a lot. 